and welcome back to another episode of The Way I See It. This is kind of an Advent episode. I'm talking about Jesus in the Old Testament. So here we go. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. And I ask that you'll please click subscribe and subscribe to my channel. I'm over 100 now, so I've reached that goal. And please like and share these videos with others that you think might need to deepen their worldview and just might enjoy kind of these basic entry-level concepts and ideas and ways to look at the world. But I hope that I, I touch on some deep things. As I've said before, I don't go too deeply, but I want to introduce deep concepts to kind of maybe get you started and send you on your way to look more deeply. And hopefully I'm getting you a little deeper than maybe you have gone in the past in your understanding of scripture and your walk with God. So remember to leave me a comment at the end of this video or during this video. If you have any questions or suggestions or just debate or anything like that, I welcome all those comments and I will respond to them. So I wanted to kind of do an Advent Jesus in the Old Testament episode because I thought, well, it's, it's apropos because we're right here before Christmas. And Jesus said that the Old Testament scriptures, which he didn't call the Old Testament because there was no New Testament yet when he was speaking this, but he said that all the scriptures point to him. He talked about how he had come to fulfill the promises of the promised Messiah and that all of the scripture was, was about him and what he was going to do. One of those places was in Luke chapter 4 verses 17 through 21 where he sits down in the temple and a scroll of Isaiah is handed to him and he opens up and he reads from Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and everyone was looking at him and he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So that's one, one place. Another place is after his resurrection, and I've quoted this before, when he's with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and starting in verse 25, he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Later in that same chapter, he's with his disciples, and in verse 44, he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He's telling us that the Old Testament is about me. It's pointing to me. So I'm going to go through and give you some several examples of how we see Christ either predicted or even revealed in what's called a Christophany. A Christophany is like an appearance of Christ before he was incarnate as Jesus of Nazareth. Remember, Christ is his title. That's Messiah. That means Messiah. So we see him in the Old Testament, but not known as Jesus of Nazareth yet. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 3. This is one of the predictions. This is after Adam and Eve have sinned and God comes down and he gets on to them and he says, you're going to have to leave the garden. And he tells the Lord, the Lord says to the serpent in verse 14, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I'm not sure who the serpent's offspring are, but Jesus told people, you know, in the New Testament that they were children of the devil. So, <laughs> children of Satan. So I guess anybody who's evil or comes against God or comes against his elect or comes against the Messiah is considered a child of Satan. Um, and also, it's interesting to note here that this is talking about her offspring. As we see all through scripture, we're told that so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he, it's always following the line of the men, usually, he begat so-and-so, and he had this son, and he had these sons, and so, but this is talking about not the offspring of Adam. This is talking about the offspring of the woman, her. 
And so we see that as pointing forward to Jesus, who will be the offspring of the woman, Mary, and he's going to crush the head of Satan at his crucifixion, although Satan strikes his heel and that the wound, you know, the mortal wound is him dying on the cross. So that's the first, you know, revelation of the promised Messiah. We see it right at the very beginning, right when Adam and Eve sin in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 12, this is where God calls Abram, starting right at the beginning of the chapter. The Lord had said to Abram, had said to Abram, go from your country, because we learn later from Paul, I believe, that God called him while his father was still alive and back when he was in Ur, and they had gone to Haran, but they didn't go all the way to where he was supposed to go um, at the very beginning, to, to Bethel or wherever that was. He, he stopped in Haran, and it was after his father died that he then it's then in chapter 12 moves on from there so that's why i think here in chapter 12 it says the lord had said to abram not just the lord said to abram go from your country your people and your father's household to the land i will show you so now he's at this point in genesis 12 he had previously stopped off but now that his dad is he moves on verse 2 i will make you into a great nation and i will bless you i will make your name great and you will be a blessing I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So you see in chapter 12 there that Abraham is going to be a great nation, and all of the nations will be blessed through him. So that is pointing to how Jesus, who's going to come from his line, is going to, as Messiah, bless everyone in the world. And also, I think it's in general just how we're blessed, like, the Jews have done good things in the world, you know, great inventions, and they've just been a people of peace. I would say even now, although I know the nation of Israel now is not the the covenant familial Israel of the Old Testament, um, still just their model of government there in the Middle East is the is more peaceful than you know other models of government. So, but specifically, the, the nations, for us as Christians, we believe that that promise of the blessings to the world through you is, is referring to how Jesus came and brings people who are Gentiles even into the family of God through his sacrifice on the cross. Then in Genesis chapter 16, we have our first Christophany. And this is like where you kind of see it, a Christ figure or a pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament, but not specifically Yahweh God. So we see that Abram and Sarah can have babies, and so they, you know, it's been, who knows how long it's been since God originally promised um, that Abram would have children, a, a son, and she's like, the Sarah's thinking, well, maybe I'm not supposed to be the mother, so I'll give him my slave girl and make her have his baby. So, you know, she gets pregnant. Then she, you know, despises Sarah, and Sarah gets angry, and she sends her away. And so she runs off, and Sarah mistreated Hagar in verse 6, so she fled from her. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord, this is why I think it's not Yahweh himself, it's not God the Father, it's the angel of the Lord, found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, You are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You will name him Ishmael. Yada, yada, yada. Verse 13, She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And so... Right there, she worships him, and we see that he does not um, tell her not to do that. Because anytime you see angels just being angels in the Bible, messengers and that kind of thing, and someone worships an angel, the angel will typically say, don't worship me, worship God. Like, I'm a created being just like you are, get up, don't worship me. But in this case, she calls him the God who sees me, and we don't have any sort of rebuke recorded for that. Another place while I'm on Christophanies, I'm going to just jump to the next Christophany and then go back and kind of 
talk about some other some other cases of pointing forward to Christ. But this is another actual Christophany is in the book of Joshua chapter five, which is the like the night before they're gonna go attack Jericho. Well, the night before they're gonna start marching around Jericho for a whole week. So starting in chapter five, verse thirteen, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. so this is considered another Christophany because he doesn't say, I am Yahweh, your God. He says, I'm the commander of of the army of the Lord, but he's not just an angel because he again here he accepts the worship of Joshua and he says to him the same words that God said. God who called himself Yahweh when he was talking or Jehovah, we're not quite sure how to pronounce that name, but we just typically say Yahweh or Jehovah if we're saying the name of the Lord. Um, when he called himself by that name at the burning bush where Moses was talking to him, he told Moses to take off his sandals because he was on holy ground. Well, here he doesn't say himself by that name. He says, I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. So this is why people believe this is another Christophany. This is an example of God the Son coming. He accepts worship because he is higher than the angels and he's worthy to be worshiped, yet he does not refer to himself as God by that name. So going back into the book of Genesis, the whole end of the book of Genesis, the story of Joseph is a kind of Christ story. Now, Joseph himself was not perfect, you know, sinless or anything like that. But you see this sort of play out similarly to Christ in these ways. He's a type of Christ in that he's hated by his own. Now, you could say, well, maybe he was a jerk. Maybe he was real cocky. The point is, he was hated by his own. You know, his brothers, they sold him to slavery. So, because of that, he had to suffer but then through his suffering he was exalted to a high place and then because of that he was he saved many people he was able to save his whole family because of that so we kind of see that play out in a similar step-by-step -step way to to the story of Christ and then we're gonna jump into Exodus chapter 12 this is the Passover so God gives Moses some very explicit instructions on how to do the Passover, what day of the month to bring the lamb in, and then what day to slaughter it, and all that. This is in chapter 12 of Exodus, and starting in verse 7, he says, Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. And then skipping down to verse 12, he says, On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. And there again, that word Lord is that, that name that we're not quite sure how to pronounce, but we say Yahweh, so I am Yahweh. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Skipping down to verse 28, the Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. So we see that the Passover lamb, the blood of that lamb, protected them from the judgment of God. And of course, obviously, when Jesus comes on the scene, John points to him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's later, as we see later, the sacrificial lamb that covers the sins of the people. Um, those are all pointing to Jesus, as Jesus is saying to his disciples after his resurrection. This is all about me. This is, this is what it's about. Then in Numbers chapter 21, they're out there in the wilderness wandering around and, well, they're not really wandering. They know where they're supposed to go. They're just being held because of their unbelief until this generation dies and then the next generation grows up and then they get to go into the promised land. We say wandering like they didn't know where they were going. They totally knew where they were going. They were just stuck there. 
So at this point, they're grumbling again, and I've done a video before on muttering. You can check that out. And they're saying, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? And so the Lord sent venomous snakes. Some say, some versions say like fiery snakes. <laughs> but the, I think that just means the venomous, they were poisonous. And they bit the people and many Israelites died. The people came and said, we sinned. We, we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake of bronze and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Jesus quotes this act in John 3, right before John 3, 16, in like 14 and 15, when he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So he's talking about how when he, when, when he put that bronze serpent on a pole and raised it up, just like Jesus being raised upon the cross of wood, the people could look and be saved. They could be saved from this judgment and this death. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God is making a promise to David, who's currently the king at this point, sitting on the throne. So David wants to make a house, a temple for God. He's been in a, he's been, the ark has been carried around with the tabernacle all this time. And again, that's another Jesus saying, this all is about me, right? Because when we, we see that John tells us in the very beginning of chapter 1 of John, that when Jesus came, he tabernacled among us. So he was like, God in a tabernacle with us, with humanity. But back here in ancient Israel, they had been carrying the ark and putting it in the tabernacle every, everywhere they went, and David wanted to make a house for God. So God tells Nathan to go to David and say, starting in verse 5, chapter 7, verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says, Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any one of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. And he goes on down to verse uh, 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days, verse 12, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom, that's Solomon. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Solomon built the first temple, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So that's telling us that, and on verse 16 there again, it says, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so, obviously, we see that Jesus was a descendant of David, and we believe that his kingdom will endure forever. He is the forever king that will reign. He's the fulfillment of that promise of God. The last two passages are from the prophets, Isaiah and Malachi. Obviously, these are some famous. This first one especially is famous, very famous. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Skipping on down to verse 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it, with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God, his zeal for himself, for his own glory, will accomplish this. Not us and our human might or strength trying to make things happen geopolitically in the world. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So that, and we see, I'm reading all these passages and you're like, Old Testament, Old Testament, Old Testament. But we have to realize these are hundreds spanning hundreds of years. In my video that I did on three reasons why I believe, part of it, part of my reason for my belief is this long history of God telling one story and remaining faithful to it and us seeing things that were promised come to fruition 
Everything points to the next thing, points to the next thing, points to Jesus. And Jesus accomplishes it. He fulfills it. The last passage I want to read is Malachi, from Malachi chapter 3. It starts off, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way for me. And that's a, so here it's a lowercase m. I'm, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger, now it's a capital M, M like it's a different messenger. The messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he is coming. So the first messenger clearing the way before we believe to be John the Baptist. Then the Lord you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant you desire. See, he is coming. Now, I don't know if this is talking about Jesus in the first coming of Jesus, how him coming to his temple, that was, that was his appearing. Because then it says in verse 2, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who will be able to stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire and like cleansing lye. He will be like a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Then they will present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will please the Lord as in days of old and years gone by. So, and he goes on to talk about how he's coming in judgment. So Jesus talked about how he's going to return and he's going to judge the world. So a lot of times when you read Old Testament prophecies, you have to see that the prophecy itself, in one prophecy, you're seeing it like you're seeing it like this, but in reality it's it's like this. It's almost like an optical illusion. <laughs> it's so things that are spoken at the same time are maybe not going to actually happen at the same time. So we, we can see in one prophecy how it can be read multiple ways. And, oh, it was fulfilled in this way, we see here. But Jesus himself said there's going to be future judgment. So we can see how it can be fulfilled at some time not yet, has, which has not yet come. So those, and then 400 years of silence, and then Jesus is born. <laughs> so those were my passages, and there's more, obviously. And this, is good, this video could go on for an hour if I was just talking about it could go on for days. I could do multiple installments of how Jesus is predicted and how everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. But what I wanted to do was just show you more than just like that one place in Isaiah where it says, For unto us a child is born. How so much of the Old Testament, not just the verses are about Jesus, but how the actual developments of the actions of God's people points to Jesus, you know? So I, that's what I wanted to bring out in this video, and I hope I did. I hope I revealed something to you that maybe you had not known before or had not thought of before, so that when you're reading the Old Testament, you can see, ah, oh, that's, we see how Jesus fulfilled that, or we see how what God is promising here is, is going to be fulfilled, or it's about Jesus, or what Jesus did for us is the same as what God did for his people in the Old Testament in that way. That was all a, some sort of signpost, a type, and a shadow that pointed to this ultimate fulfillment in Christ for the world. Thank you so much for watching, and please like and subscribe to my channel and share these videos. Give me a comment, and Merry Christmas. Wonderful.